Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. Good morning. It's 6 o'clock here in Calgary, Alberta, uh, Friday, April 30th, and I'm happy to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And, um, yeah, I'm just glad to be able to continue to do this show and, and, and all the shows that I've been doing um, since, really, since December of last year. And... Um, you know, I thank you so much for tuning in and joining uh, joining in with me. Um, we're going to continue looking at what we, where we left off yesterday. Uh, an article that I found on, at the Awareness Center, and that is uh, www.theawarenesscenter.org. And uh, it's called Common Coping Mechanisms Used by Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. And we were going through some of these. There's 20, I think they list here, 21 um, common coping, coping mechanisms used by people who have survived uh, childhood sexual abuse, and it's quite interesting to see, to, to go through them. Um, there's an important reminder at the top of the page, and it says, when reviewing this list, it is important to remember that the information provided should not be used as the sole determiner of childhood sexual abuse. Um, this list only provides the reader with a list of some common coping mechanisms that are used by many adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. It is also important to remember that coping mechanisms are learned behavior patterns, uh, learned behavioral patterns used to cope. They are not necessarily all good or bad. And many individuals have used their abuse uh, learned coping mechanisms to benefit them professionally and in other personal situations. So that's a little note that they put there for everybody when you're reading that article and you can check it out. It's um, it's by Victoria Poland and Gail Roy and uh, from the Awareness Center um, Incorporated out of Baltimore, Maryland. And I've, I just found this article online while I was searching for information regarding uh, adult survivor issues of, you know, of of adults who have suffered as uh, suffered childhood sexual abuse, so I just found that's how I found this article, and I thought it was quite interesting to take a look at all the different things that uh, you know that some of us do and have experienced as far as uh, coping mechanisms and things that we sort of learn as behaviors as adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse and what we go through. So that's why I'm I'm, I'm interested in, in looking at this um, as I'm a survivor of childhood uh, sexual molestation and also abuse so you know i just think there's the more information we can get out to people the better right you know i'm i'm not a professional i don't hold any professional counseling certificates or therapist certificates i'm just a survivor who uh who fight for child rights first of all i'm an advocate for for children i stand up for children against abuse i would like to see child abuse stopped and uh, for good once and for all um, and that's really my life's mission. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. Uh, that's such a, really such an honor and, and such an awesome uh, volunteer position to hold because um, it, it, you know, it's just one more voice out there, one more person. The more people we can get involved to stand up, really, and uh, start really sharing the word uh, regarding education. Uh, you know, awareness, education, prevention of child abuse, the more likely we're going to be able to make a difference for children out there today and tomorrow and the next day who are being abused right now. Uh, they need help and they need all of us to stand up and do something. Uh, they need they need all of us to get involved, right? And so that's why I thought, you know, I'm just going to do this show and, and uh, get as much information out there as I can while I'm doing this show. <clears throat> so... That's why I'm doing it, and just uh, because I believe education is the key, and uh, people, if pe- and awareness, you know what people don't know about, they can't fix. If there's problems that people are not aware of, they can't fix these problems. And uh, if there's a lack of education, people don't know how to handle it. And so I think child abuse is not talked about enough, and that's why I, d- I decided to do this show. And uh, after I was listening to some a show here on Blog Talk Radio back last year. Um, that uh, it was Voices of Hope, Gail Crabtree, Voices of Hope, here on Blog Talk Radio, an awesome uh, Blog Talk Radio show. And um, I just clicked on Create Your Own Account, and sure enough, within a matter of minutes, I had my own radio show. So that's what happened. Uh, I didn't. It was sort of by accident that I stumbled upon Blog Talk Radio. And uh, I'm glad that I did because it's a great medium for people to get uh, some good some good information out to others, and it's a great place for others to find. Uh, you know, people who who 
who have some different information to offer and also who have who've experienced these things and who've been through it. And there's lots and lots of good information on, on Blog Talk Radio if you check it out. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. If you're a young person under the age of 18, please have a, someone okay it that you can listen to this show. It's ultimately for children, about child abuse, about stopping child abuse for once and for all. But there's a lot of adult content on here on this show. I cover everything regarding abuse of, of all kinds domestic violence, abuse, child abuse, everything to do with child abuse. So that's why if you're a young person, it's good for you to have someone to listen to the show with you because they can help you then if you have questions or some something you just didn't understand and then it might you know bother you that you can't find the information. So and I just think online safety for children is top priority. Um, it's so important that you keep yourself safe. Kids are dying because uh, they, a child sexual predator is getting a hold of them, and uh, if they're not killing them, then they're they're ruining their lives because they're assaulting them. Uh, children are, are losing their lives every day, and uh, the FBI has a great website out there regarding how to stay safe online for parents and for children, and um, you ought to check that out. There's a quote on there. I don't want to misquote it, but it's in the millions. There are millions of child sexual predators online looking to get a hold of children. So all I can say is you do not want to lose your life to a child sexual predator, and you do not want to have your life ruined by a child sexual predator. Keep yourself safe. Have someone listen to this show with you and make sure it's okay, and have them check out whatever you're doing online who you're chatting with, what you're doing, and make sure you keep yourself safe, right? If you don't have a parent who who cares, which quite often I know we don't, that's why I'm talking about child abuse, right? There's many times parents are not capable of caring about their children. My parents weren't. Um, but the thing is, is uh, then you have to find a teacher, a counselor, guidance counselor at school, uh, someone you trust, a coach, a mentor, someone who's been there for you who will uh, just listen in and make sure it's okay for you to listen to this show. So thanks everybody. We'll get right on to this. We have about 22 minutes left and it's so interesting. Uh, we, were, we left off yesterday. I'll just go through a little bit of this article, Common Coping Mechanisms Used by Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. And that's from, I'll give you that website again, www.theawarenesscenter, all one word, dot org, www.theawarenesscenter.org. And uh, they were listing here, we went over minimizing abuse, uh, you know, minimizing the offender's actions, rationalizing uh, the, vi- the victimization, right? Just saying, oh, well, they didn't know any better or they were abused as well, so that's why they abused me sort of thing. Denial, that's one. Denying the abuse ever happened just because the pain of trying to face it's just too too hard. And that's why people have to reach out and get help, you know. It's so important not to sit and suffer in silence. I'm so glad I finally started reaching out and, and uh, getting some, some help from people. I never really went and got any therapy, therapy or anything because I just can't afford it. But um, I got online to some online support groups for child abuse survivors. And they it's just awesome. It is so awesome to know there's people out there. Well, it's sad, really, to know that there's so many people out there who have been abused. But the thing is, is it's, it's, uh, it's helpful to talk to other survivors who are working on their healing because they in turn want you to heal and want you know they they want me to get well and be and have a good life and so therefore the support is there right so important to get that help right even you know like you know getting a therapist or a counselor like down the road I very well may do that so especially if I can afford to right um, repression forgetting that's one another way right that survivors cope. Splitting, seeing the world in terms of black and white, no shades of gray. Uh, Common in survivors when the behavior of the offender was either abusive or loving, but no middle ground, like no middle of the road sort of thing. Um, We looked at lack of integration, feeling on the inside that, you know, we're bad or evil, and then on the outside being like a super achiever, right? Try to do everything and be perfect and all that. Uh, Out of body experiences during the abuse, feeling that one watched the abuse occurring to one's body and and we were talking a little bit about that. Control issues. It says the more chaotic family life in childhood, the stronger control issues are an issue. So that's what we were looking at yesterday. Today we're going to start out with uh, number nine, disassociation of spacing out. Um, it says everyone does this at times. The difference is degree and frequency. Example of normal dissociation, driving a car and realizing you are farther along than you believed. So disassociation, I know that's a real problem for a lot of people and um, who've suffered childhood sexual abuse. So I've talked to many survivors 
who've had that um, that issue, and that's just horrible. I cannot imagine uh, myself. I did not have any dissociation or spacing out. Um, I've been very cognitive the whole time. So um, the only thing I did do was repress some memories. So, uh, but not spacing out time and blocks of time. That I don't seem to have. I uh, didn't seem to have a problem with. But I know there's so many people out there who have, and it's a real uh, scary thing for them to try to piece back together, you know, how many years they, they lost or how many years they were actually uh, disassoci- disassociated from uh, the whole thing. And also, you know, people ha- will um, split into, uh, you know, other personalities, too, that will take over so that the... the so that the survivor, so that the, per, the the child who's being abused does not have to suffer that, uh, they'll go somewhere else, and then this other um, personality, this other entity within them, will um, take over while the abuse is happening, and so they they end up with multiple personalities. And I've heard this, I've, I, I know quite a few people who've suffered with this, and it's very sad. I know I, I never developed that. And I thank God, you know. Um, but I feel my heart is with everybody out there who's experienced that uh, because I cannot imagine, you know, um, I just, you know, I know I feel like I have a an inner child who was, who was very angry for a long time, but she doesn't have her own personality. It's just me and it's just my own way of looking at it as far as my inner child goes. It's that part of me that's still very much, um, you know, wounded inside it and still looking for love and nurturing, right? But I, it never developed another personality, so I just feel like my heart is with everybody out there who's experienced this, and uh, you know, I, I just can't imagine how hard it is to try to deal and cope with that. And we just have to remember that we just have to keep reaching out and just keep, um, you know, finding that that help and that hope wherever we can. And uh, you know, whether it's an online support group, a good friend, you know, someone you can talk to, um, a, a therapist or counselor, right? Someone you that you you can just uh, you know, reach out to and get some help, right? Because it's not, no one should suffer in silence. No one should suffer alone in silence. Uh, regard, you know, as, as survivors of, of any kind of child abuse, right? We've we've had enough abuse and we've suffered long enough. And I just think, you know, reaching out and getting some help is very important. If we don't reach out, many times people don't realize that we were even abused as children. And because we're so good at hiding it, we're so good at, uh, like they say, super achieving on the outside, but on the inside we're suffering, right? And so lots of times people won't even know, obviously, that, you know, we've suffered these abuses as children and they won't reach out to us because they don't know. So what they don't know, they can't help. And so I think it's very important to reach out to people, let people, uh, you know, find a group that you can trust, you know, because trust is a huge issue with survivors of any kind of abuse, you know, whether it's domestic violence, uh, uh, childhood sexual abuse, childhood abuse of any kind. It's hard to learn how to trust again. And if you never, ever did learn to trust, uh, which was my issue, um, you have to learn how to trust. And so um, it's, it's a learned behavior. But, you know, I, I'm willing to give people a try because I think, hey, I want to be trusted. I want people to trust me. So if I want people to trust me, then I, in turn, have to learn how to trust them. It's been a great healing experience for me um, to learn how to do this. I'm still working on it, but I've come a long, long way uh, compared to where I was, you know, years before, at least, especially the last three years. So we'll we'll move on to the next step here, hyper-awareness or super-alert. So this is another common coping mechanism used by adult survivors, Um, awareness of everyone and everything around you. And that I have a bit of a, an issue with. I'm always super alert. Um, as a child, I had to be super alert just to stay, just to stay out of harm's way in the home. And so, uh, and also, I was just constantly concerned that, um, you know, there, because there was always violence in the home. So I never wanted to be in the room when, a, when violence was going to erupt. So I was always super alert, listening for, listening to conversations in the house. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily be in the same room, but I would be listening as hard as I could to hear what was going on, and that way I could be prepared, you know, for whatever was going to happen afterwards. So I carried that into my adult life. Obviously, it was a learned behavior, and I've been doing it since I was a young child, a young kid. So, um, you know, so it's hard for me to not be super alert and, and be paying attention to every single thing around me, and it does kind of wears you out sometimes because you're paying attention all the time to stuff that you have might not really need to be paying attention to, you know, like at work, I can hear every single conversation going on around me and um, I can't really tune it out. It's not something I can actually tune out. So I tend to, 
you know, well, actually know everybody's business, first of all. And then second of all, um, it's just too much, you know, to have to be paying attention to all the time. So it is hard for sure. Uh, workaholism and business, uh, that's another one. Staying busy is one way of avoiding feelings. And that's really, a lot of people, even if they weren't abused, have that issue. Uh, you know, they just want to work all the time so they don't have to face things in their lives, you know what I mean? But especially for people who have been abused, they tend to want to stay busy all the time so that they don't feel, they don't ever have to sit down and feel like, um, uh, to let the feelings actually come to surface, right? As long as they stay busy, as long as they, you know, keep every single moment filled with something, then they don't have to to allow themselves to feel these things. And, uh, you know, I guess, it's, you know, it's a good, it's a common coping mechanism. And in a way, it's good to be busy and stay busy and, and, and be uh, proactive and just go, go, go. You know, that's what I, I try to uh, actually balance my life. But the thing is, um, I know how that can happen, and, and you know, just in order to not face things, just stay so busy. But I actually started allowing myself to sit down and feel these things. That was about, well, you know, at least in the last three years, um, I have actually allowed myself the time to sit down and feel the things I need to feel. But you have to be in a safe place to do that, and especially if you're, uh, you know, if you've had uh, like self mutilation, self harming issues, things like that, self injury. Um, you don't. You want to make sure that you, uh, if you're going to allow yourself to feel things, that you have someone with you when you're going to do that, or you know your therapist or counselor. Uh, you know you might want to see them and check with them before you you do that because certain things are just so hard to face, right? Especially when we're on our own, and uh, sometimes you want to be with somebody when you're going to face these things, right? And allow yourself the time to to, to work through them. So. You know, I'm safe enough to do that, so I can sit back and spend time thinking about all this stuff, no problem. But I know that other people, um, just depending on where they're at in their healing, it would be very hard for them. So you want to make sure that you do have someone with you if you're going to start, you know, setting aside time to actually look at the abuse and uh, and, and allow yourself to feel what you need to feel from it, right? There's so many great coping mechanisms out there for survivors of, of any kind of abuse, whether it's domestic violence, child abuse, um, you know, with coping lists where uh, you can, uh, we'll go through some of those too, I'm, I already have on, on old shows like back in December, probably January, uh, regarding, you know, how you can cope with uh, abuse and the aftermath, right, like uh, write, keeping a journal, uh, writing letters to your abuser and then tearing them up, you know, you can say whatever you want in this letter and you don't have to give it to them if you don't feel like it's the proper thing to do and then or if you can't give it to them because this person is gone or whatever um you can write out whatever you want to say and then you can either keep the letter and then uh put it away somewhere safely until you want to look at it again or you can tear it up into a million pieces and throw it all over the place and stomp on it and get mad and uh but if, you know we want to make sure we're in the proper uh you know, frame of mind when we're going to do these things, right? So important. And um, another one, is, number 12, is escape or running away. Passive ways include reading books, sleeping, and watching television. Uh, it's important to remember fantasies can be a source of rich creative life and can be vital to healing. So as an adult, you know, if we're trying to escape or run away as an adult, you know, um, which is really what I did, like I ran away at the age of 30, um, <laughs> it's kind of it's crazy, but I, I finally ran away at the age of thirty, and um, you know, as an adult, we we lots of people do tend to do that. They escape from uh, from the from the bad feelings that are in their heart, you know, by by just sleeping all the time, you know, or reading books all the time, or just being gone all the time, um, watching television, you know, sort of thing. That's passive ways of, of escaping and running away. Some people actually later on in, in their adult, you know, lives, if, if they suffered abuse, especially very traumatic uh, childhood sexual abuse, they, they, they actually run away, period. They just, they can't take the, uh, they just can't take the, the suffering anymore. So they just run away thinking that if they leave the, where they are, that they'll feel better, or, you know what I mean? And a lot of times, you know, we can't run away from ourselves. That's the whole issue. Um, you know, I think when I was 30, I was actually running, uh, finally making a decision to run away from the whole thing and, in fact, found out that I could never, ever run away from it. I was going to have to face it. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it is hard on people, absolutely hard on people. Uh, number 13, psychiatric hospitalizations can be used as a respite from intense feelings and or flashbacks. So, you know, I know that um, there's lots of people that I've talked to that have gone, you know, into... Um, 
the hospital for psychiatric treatment because of abuse that they suffered and because they just can't cope and um, they find that, you know, they want to self-injure and self-harm and so they have to go and spend time, you know, hospitalized because of this issue and uh, it's very sad and it's, um, you, you know, but thank God these people recognize that they need to go, you know, to the hospital. If you, if, if you get that down and that low, uh, you know, to where you just cannot pick yourself up and no one around you can help you pick yourself up you know it's so important to get help because my brother killed himself uh at the age of 33 he was a drug addict so of course it looked great you know oh well you know he was just a drug addict so he killed himself uh he had so many psychological and mental issues because of the abuse that he suffered um drug addict, drugs were just a uh, escape mechanism for him and um he ended up killing himself and he had tried many times before he finally killed himself at the age of 33, he just could not live. He could not find a way to live. And so I wish he would have just checked himself into a hospital uh, because, you know, he might still be here today had he done that. And so I wish people would just uh, get help, you know. We don't deserve to suffer any anymore. I just think people who have been abused in the past, whether it's children or adults in, in, in abusive situations and domestic violence and whatnot, and children who have been abused, we don't deserve to suffer anymore. You know, we really don't. We've had enough suffering. We've had enough abuse. And I think, you know, we deserve to have a good life, just like everybody else. We deserve to walk free and, and, and have a good life like everyone else. But, of course, it's not going to happen without our first taking that first step to get that help, making that uh, first initial step and saying, I need help. Hello. You know? Uh, instead of just suffering along in silence and then ending our lives, right? You know, I mean, I had... My, my, mom, my mom was... Uh, had suicidal tendencies. She passed it on to all of us because all of my, our lives, that's all we heard was that she should have killed herself. She should have killed us. This was kind of like a daily conversation, right? Um, you know, we should have killed the whole family. Like my dad would say, he should have just killed us all. So uh, we grew up listening to this stuff. So it was very hard to stay alive, right? It was hard to actually want to, um, it was hard to find that thing inside of you that says, no, we need to stay alive. We need to fight to stay alive. Well, I finally found that at the age of 40. It took me for a long, long time to find that, but I, I finally found it. I wish my brother would have found it as well. And uh, so that's the thing. Just keep reaching out. You know, we do deserve to have a good life like everyone else. If no one's told you that, well, that's the truth. Uh, number 14, self-mutilation, self -mutilation, self-harm, self-injury. And they, they just list here internalization of offender in Instead of being hurt by victimizer, survivor hurts oneself, often release, releases intense feelings and or numbness after mutilation occurs. So, you know, I myself wanted to self-harm. I, I actually did as a youth, uh, uh, well, I actually, yeah, I did a lot of drugs and a, a massive amount of drugs in a, in a nine-year nine period when I was really young from the age of 12 until I was 21. And... You know, that was very harm, harmful. I was just trying to escape. I actually wasn't necessarily trying to injure myself. Now, when I got older, uh, in my 30s, I wanted to self-harm because I wanted to show people the pain that was on the inside of my heart. And uh, I never did actually really do any damage to myself. And really, just at the age of 40, decided that the last time I was actually thinking of doing that, um, I decided, I said, why am I doing this? You know, no one's going to care. There's not one person in my life that's going to care if I if I injure myself or kill myself. So who who is this benefiting and, and what, what would be the purpose of this? Because I got finally tired of it and I was sitting on the couch by myself and I thought, you know, like I if I do this, then I allow my abusers to win because if I hurt myself and uh, continue to try to destroy my life or end my life, that lets my parents win this fight. So then I got really mad and I thought, no way, I'm winning this fight. I am not hurting myself. And I'm not going to commit suicide ever, 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 because that allows the, you know, my abusers to win this fight, you know. And I thought, no way, I am not doing it. So like a dog with a bone, I am, right? So I'm like, no, I got mad. I got off the couch. I started working on my healing at that point, started getting involved in trying to help other people. And, you know, um, yeah, it, that's what it took, really, was for me to see that by injuring myself, uh, no one was going to care and it would have allowed my parents to win this fight, you know. They uh, they tried to kill us all years before, and uh, and I thought, I'm not doing it for them, forget it. But that was always my thought, that, you know, they should have just gone ahead and killed us, or, or we should, you know, death was just such a huge part of my life. It was actually my life, right? So, 
you know, I just did, I hope everyone will just get the fight to live and, and you know, reach reach way out for that help as far as you can go. If you don't find the help that you need right away, you just keep reaching out and make sure that you do not end your life and harm yourself. It's so important, <clears throat> you know, because we've suffered enough abuse. Like, I, that's what I was just saying, right? We've been through enough. We've been through too much already. And we owe it to ourselves, really, to not hurt ourselves any further than we've already been hurt, right? Um, but I know that a lot of people self-injure, and I know the reasons behind it. Sometimes it's just so that they can feel, period, you know, because they can't feel anything. So they feel like, well, if I, if I, if I just do this, then I'll be able to feel something. Even if it's pain, it's better than nothing. Well, all I can say is really, it's better to get help and get a therapist, get a counselor, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going here, you know, reach out and get some help and not hurt yourself any more than you've already been hurt, right? It's just so sad. Uh, the next one is um, suicide attempts, number 15. Often occurs when survivors feel, uh, feel trapped with no way out. Don't kill yourself. Call a friend, your therapist, or a crisis hotline instead. And that's just it, you know, like uh, my brother killed himself. Another one of my brothers died of a drug overdose in a shelter here in Calgary at the age of 43, uh, but he knew what he was doing, and he knew eventually those drugs were going to take him out. And um, that's the sad thing. That's, that's uh, you know, it was hard to watch that two brothers gone because they could not cope as adults. Uh, and it was no wonder because I saw what they went through as young men and young boys in the home. Uh, there was there was uh, so much abuse, and so especially towards them, um, th those two brothers, right? For some reason, uh, my parent, my especially my dad, just did not have. Uh, he he was trying to just destroy them, right? So my mother was trying to destroy me. My dad was trying to destroy them, and then a few of the other siblings actually didn't didn't take uh, didn't have the same abuse problems because my parents sort of left them alone. So it was just a few of us that our parents sort of targeted their main abuse on, and we're the ones that actually went on to to really suffer and do a lot of drugs and uh, and I thought I'm not ending my life that way I'm just not you know I'm going to get I'm going to just I'm going to fight this thing and fight to live right so that's what I wish everybody would do is fight to live not fight to die you know what I mean uh we deserve to live and we deserve to have a good life right well we got a couple minutes left and I have lots of great friends in the chat room thank you so much for tuning in I really appreciate that and then you know just the support is just awesome and uh it's great to have you here and so we'll continue on with this. We have, uh, I'll look at the next one, isolation. Feeling safer when alone. No one can hurt me if I'm alone, right? That's what someone, a survivor might think, right? And, you know, I kind of live my life a lot like that just because I have trust issues and I don't, you know, I don't make friends that easily. And, and if when I do make a friend and then if they end up really, you know, doing something that hurts me or, or, you know, I feel like they've done something that's hurt me, then I tend to blow them off completely, like right away. They're just out of my life, like within instant, like two seconds, they're just gone. And so, um, you know, I have a bit of a problem with that. So I have to work on that because it's no fun to be alone and uh, suffering alone, sitting around by yourself all the time. Um, it's good to have friends, you know. It's good to have people in your life that you can count on to be there for you. But I choose my friends very carefully, you know, especially nowadays because I choose people who want to, who want good things for me and who want to support me and just like I want for them, right? I want to support them and have, you know, see them go far in their lives. It's very important to pick, you know, good positive people to be around, right? When you've suffered through this kind of stuff and people who were there and will, will be there on the bad days as well as the good days, right? So important because that's a real friend. Someone who will be there with you on your worst day. That's your best friend. Uh, we have about a minute left. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to I'm going to leave this article right here. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and I'm so happy to be with them. Let me tell you what, I'm happy uh, to take on this role. It's a volunteer role, and uh, it makes me so happy to be able to stand up and, and try to stop child abuse with them and, and with all with everyone out there who is doing that. Thank you so much, because um, you know my heart is just so thankful. Um, check out our website. It's uh, http dreamcatchersforabusechildren.com, and we also have uh, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio here on Block Talk Radio. Uh, dot com. That's uh, at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash dreamcatchers. And next, starting next week in May, uh, May 3rd to be exact, on Monday, May 3rd, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio is going to have a show Monday through Friday. So a show every day of the week. So I hope you can tune in. There will be different hosts, uh, different guests. It's going to be just awesome. The information 
is going to be awesome regarding child abuse prevention, what's happening, uh, the latest news on child abuse uh, prevention, and uh, really just getting that word out there. And, uh, yeah, if you suspect child abuse, you have to report it. Do the right thing. Um, don't let a child suffer in silence. Don't, don't let a child be, be abused. Make the phone call and know the signs and symptoms. It's so important to know the signs and symptoms of child abuse and know how to report it. So you can find that information on our website and lots of other websites out there. There's some great websites out there regarding child abuse prevention. And But I happen to be a little biased on ours. I really like uh, Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. So um, I hope you will check it out. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Have a great day. You guys are in my heart. And, you know, I love you all so much. Thank you so much for, for being here for me. And take good care of yourselves. I'll be on tonight, 9.30 p.m. Uh, child abuse prevention and human rights abuse prevention is up to us, talking about domestic violence. And uh, just take care, everybody. Have a great day. Keep yourself safe.